Okay, thank you very much. Hello, everyone. So in this talk, I'm not going to touch upon many different things. And my goal is not to necessarily to give you all the answers, but hopefully raise some questions and ignite some discussion. So as we have seen in previous talks earlier this week, we can learn a lot about nuclear synthesis from chemical evolution, not only in the Milky Way itself, but also from the many dwarf galaxies that surround it. And these dwarf galaxies, they have a wide range of properties and offer us the chance to probe different uh, nuclear synthetic processes in various environments. It is impossible to cover everything that dwarf galaxies teach us in one talk like this, but I'm going to focus on a few very interesting aspects. So I'm going to start with CMP nose stars. And so what are CMP nose stars exactly? These are carbon-rich metal core stars that are believed to show the nucleosynthetic signatures of the very first metal-free stars. You can see them here on the plot in black uh, points uh, for the Milky Way. And contrary to the CMPS sisters, these are not primarily bi in binary systems. And as you can see, the carbon increases as you go to lower metallicity. And this makes us believe that the high carbon comes from the earliest star, star formation, pot three stars, if you will. Also on this plot are uh, dwarf galaxy stars, and they are color-coded by the size of the galaxy. And we can immediately see that the smallest ones, the so-called the ultra-faint dwarfs in yellow and red, they have a very similar overall trend as the Milky Way halo. But as we go to larger dwarf galaxies, these stars become more and more difficult to find, like the blue and the purple points. And this has inspired a lot of discussion on if there is a lack of these CMP no stars in dwarf seroidal galaxies or not. But not only are these stars difficult to find in these larger galaxies, but the ones we do find are strange. So here you see a CMP no star in sculpture in red and the general sculpture population in blue and Milky Way halo stars in gray. And what we see is that the carbon is high because this is a carbon enhanced metal four star, but all the alpha and the iron peak are basically the same as any other metal low metallicity stars. However, when we come to the light neutron capture elements, surrounding uh, the zirconium, Something weird is happening, and this star shows a very enhanced abundances of these elements, while the heavier elements are quite low compared to other sculpture stars. And then it turned out that this star was not unique because a couple of years later, a very similar star was found in another dwarf galaxy, Carina. And this is from their paper, so here the colors are switched. The Carina star is in red and the sculpture star is in blue. And if we focus on the lower panel here, which covers the heavy elements, we can see that they have essentially the same abundance pattern. And to put this a little bit into context, I plot here the ichthyum or barium from the Milky Way stars in black and the general sculpture population in blue. And these carbon enhanced stars clearly stand out in ichthyum or barium. And this is not something normal. This is not something that we typically see for CMP no stars in the Milky Way. And just to keep life interesting, in 2018, Speed et al. found another such star, this time in Piscis 2, which is an ultra-faint dwarf galaxy. So these stars are not only limited to the larger dwarf seroidal, but they also exist in the smaller system. And this raises many questions. Why are CMP no stars in dwarf galaxies different? This, I don't know. And does the high carbon and the high ithium come from the same source or are there two separate nucleosynthetic sources? This is still not completely clear. And finally, how common are these stars in any environment? Because if they exist in high numbers in dwarf galaxies, then they will exist as well in the Milky Way halo. But to quantify this, we will need a much larger samples. So now we're going to change topics slightly, but not drastically, and look at what is known about the CMP RS or the CMP I stars, so to speak say, in, uh, in dwarf galaxies. And earlier this year, there was a very interesting star found in the Sagittarius dwarf seroidal galaxy that clearly does not fit a simple s positive pattern, but requires a more complicated explanation. The authors fitted the abundance pattern with various models, uh, and they concluded that this was mo most likely a combination of the R and the S process, uh, as can be seen here, for example, in the dysprosium. 
that fits very nicely, this black line, which is the ATP plus a neutral thermometer uh, contribution. There have been several other CMP S stars in dwarf galaxy with high European or barium ratios and sort of an ambiguous origin. Here is one such star in sculpture, which is clearly not a, C a pure CMP S star and was very successfully matched with an eye process pattern. But the limited abundance measurements make it difficult to draw very strong conclusions whether this is an I or an R plus S. And the observer's favorite mantra applies here as always, we need more and we need better data. But we, we are not completely helpless even so, because we can still learn a lot about processes, not only from individual stars, but also from the overall enrichment of the galaxy. So what we did here is that from a sample of 100 stars in sculpture, we measured the global enrichment of neutron capture element and then subtracted the R process. So what you see here in the blue points are the measured abundance ratios of the combined ejecta from all the ATP stars that enrich the galaxy. So the blue points are the me measured sort of average yields of the ATP stars that uh, have enriched the sculpture over its entire evolution. And this we then compared to the to theoretical yields and uh, the ATP uh, S process yields are shown in orange from the uh, Fruity database and eye process predictions are shown in green. And the raw result is uh, very interesting because at first we see that the yttrium in sculpture is very low. So it's difficult to explain those with S process only since we expect contribution from ATP stars of different masses, basically all of the models listed here. And then when we go to lanthanum, we see that the lanthanum or barium that we measure is not consistent to the S process alone, uh, but the neodymium is consistent with both the S and the I process. So this result is very exciting because what we are now seeing is that the I process is needed to explain the overall chemical enrichment in sculpture. We cannot do this with the S process alone. This means that the I process is not only sort of a niche that we need to explain a few peculiar, peculiar stars, if you will, but it's something that has a big global impact and is necessary to understand the chemical enrichment of the galaxy as a whole. But like with all promising results, it, this raises a lot of questions. Does the eye process have a big impact in all dwarf galaxies? Is this a universal prop property alone, or is it only sculpture? And uh, can a more complete abundance pattern tell us something more concrete about the eye process site itself? This is all very new. We are only starting to move in this direction, but we're hoping that with more data, we will start to really provide some important insights into the eye process. So now finally, I'm going to spend a few minutes on the R process. And first, before I go any further, I want to show you what delayed processes look like in the context of chemical evolution. Here we have two examples, supernova type 1A and the S process. Both of these processes involve evolution of low mass stars and therefore have long time scales compared to core collapse supernova, which creates nearly all the magnesium in the universe. So what we see here are average trends of stars, uh, Milky Way in gray and dwarf galaxies in colors. On the top panel, we see that the products of the supernova type 1A relative to, super, uh, to core collapse supernova, and it becomes more and more uh, dominant as the galaxies evolve with time and become more metal rich. The same happens for the S process as more and more stars go through the ATP stars the ratio of the S process to core collapse loop supernova increases. This happens for all delayed processes, this qualitative increase. Uh, the details depend on the star formation of the galaxy in question, like where this happens and how steep it is and so on. But this qualitative increase is something very universal. And this brings us to the next question. To question. What about the R process? do we see the same signatures of delayed contribution for the R process? And the first answer is no. If we look at two very different galaxies, the Milky Way and Sculptor, and we look at the R process relative to core collapse supernova, we see something which I think is remarkable. The trend is almost completely, completely flat. This is amazing. Nothing in Sculptor is ever flat. And the R process and core collapse supernova, this means that the R process and core collapse supernova go hand in hand throughout the evolution of these galaxies. 
So one might look at this plot and say, ah, okay, so the dominant source of the R classes is something past, possibly, re very probably related to massive stars. Fantastic, we solved it, this is done. But of course, nature doesn't usually make our lives very easy, as we all know, because then if we look at the other dwarf gal galaxies, then we see something very different. So here we have the same mean trend like before, both in Sculptor and the Milky Way are almost flat when we compare the R process to the core collapse supernova. But just to mess things up and keep us on our toes, Sagittarius and Fornax decided to show this very clear evidence of a delayed uh, contribution from the R process. And what we think that we are seeing here is evidence of two distinct R process sites, a quick and a delayed one, and depending on the star formation histories of these galaxies, either only one or both become dominant. So dwarf galaxies are currently pointing very strongly to two different R process sites. But of course we need more data to understand this better. And we are working on that. With a very big team, many of which are present here today and this week, we are trying to make this happen by applying for a foremost community survey dedicated to dwarf galaxies in the southern hemisphere. Early the, earlier this year, we submitted a letter of intent that was successful and got very positive feedback, and we are now finalizing the final proposal. So just to show you what this would mean, in gray we have the number of stars that already have detailed, detailed chemical abundance patterns in various galaxies, and in pink you see what we get before to us. And note that this is a logarithmic scale, so if this goes through, it will completely revolutionize our understanding of these systems. And with that, I leave you my final slide. Uh, the future is bright, we have many upcoming spectra, but what is important is, I think is really important is collaboration across fields. We need to be able to explain all the data, uh, both inputs from theorists and observers is very useful, especially if it's done in collaboration. And it's very sort of obvious that we will have a bottleneck when it comes to higher resolution follow-up because we will find many, many interesting objects and everyone will want to look at them. Thank you very much. This is everyone. Thank you for listening.